And I, thank you. Uh, so, I, so I will record the sessions uh, and I will post them and I'll give uh, on uh, uh, YouTube and you can have free access to them. And matter of fact, all of last year's classes are on there as well. So uh, by dates and sometimes by uh, what's about. So if you wanna see what I uh, told other people last year, you can take a look at that as well. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the holidays uh, and the problems that that creates this year in terms of our class. Okay. So I said I was going to give you an idea uh, who I am. Uh, as I said, Martin Berman, uh, I was born in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, mid-century, exactly mid-century. I was born in 1950. So yes, I'm uh, 71 years of age. Uh, and uh, I have figured out to use the computer a little bit. Uh, I'm married. My wife, Marilyn, she has occasionally popped in into the screen uh, from time to time. Uh, I may see a grandchild or two that pops in. Uh, dogs also may pop in. I hope they stay out of the room. Um, I, as I said, I, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. I attended Yeshiva University undergraduate, and that's an Orthodox uh, school. Uh, after uh, I graduated there, I went to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, which is the conservative uh, flagship uh, uh, school for, uh, for rabbis and others. And I uh, graduated in 1977, ordained in 77, and I've served pulpits in Sioux City, Iowa, uh, El Paso, Texas, Denver, Colorado, uh, Detroit, Michigan, and then I made it here in 94 to Toronto, and now I'm retired from the pulpit, uh, and I do a few rabbinic things once in a while, and I've been teaching this class for, I, I forgot exactly how many years, something like 20 years, I think, give or take. Uh, the basic material hasn't changed a whole lot in those years. It's still pretty much the, the same overall, although how I present it has changed, may change uh, from week to week even. Okay, and I'm doing this, uh, out of the goodness of my heart, also I'm paid for it. That's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm gonna put everything out honest to everybody, uh, but I really do enjoy this. This uh, Wednesday night class of mine has always been a, a wonderful experience. Uh, until uh, COVID, uh, we usually meet at the synagogue and we get to see each other in person, which is much nicer. On the other hand, there's something about the uh, convenience certainly, of uh, Zooming uh, so that people don't worry about dinner. Uh, and uh, I've got any books that I decided want to look at in behind me uh, in my library. Uh, but we'll see what will be. I'm, I'm beginning to have my second thoughts about it. Uh, COVID is not being very kind to us. Uh, so I have no idea if and when we will meet in person. If we do meet in person, it's always been in Bethlehem Synagogue, and uh, we'll go for that later on. Also, uh, during the course of this class, you have to keep in touch with your sponsoring rabbi. Whoever your sponsoring rabbi is, the individual who at the end of this course, after you've taken your tests and after you've passed the course, will be the one who decides on the next step. In conference with consultation with them, without your rabbi, uh, the two of you will decide whether or not you're ready to go before the Beit Din, the rabbinic court. Okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit more later this evening, just to give you a little bit of an idea on that. Uh, and so you must stay in touch with your sponsor. Your sponsor is not going to go looking after you. It's your responsibility. Okay? Uh, we believe that it's very good and positive to be Jewish, but we also don't believe that we have to go running after people to get them to become Jewish. If you're a good person, then God, uh, the Kaddish Baruch Hu, the Holy One, praise be He, can be very satisfied with that. Uh, if you decide to take the yoke of the commandments, all Machut Shemaim, uh, then your responsibility between you and God is magnified. It's a lot easier not being Jewish. Okay? 
So, uh, and if you take it seriously, then that will mean something to you in terms of the process. I like to tell when I've ever dealt with people, if I have my own that I sponsor, I tell them the hard part begins when you come up from the mikvah and leading a Jewish life and doing your best to satisfy what is necessary. Okay. Was there a question? You know, uh, all right. If you have a question, you can always unmute yourself and yell at me or something like that. You can't throw any chalk at me because you can't hit me. So uh, I'm not worried about that. Also, there's extra points for laughing at my jokes and minus uh, points uh, if you uh, groan too much at them. So I'm going to go down my list. Uh, well, now Amber's no longer at the top of the list. Amber's down uh, below. So I'm going to start with Emily. I want you to introduce yourself, say a little bit about you, and why you're in, begun this process uh, tonight. Okay. Emily, you're there. Hi. Okay, there you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm with my partner, Brian. <laughs> um, and we're taking this Judaism course um, just to learn more about the religion and see if this is something that is the right fit for me. That's a very legitimate rationale for it. Okay. Uh, how long have the two of you been together? Uh, we've known each other for two years, but we've been together for like a year and a half. Okay. All uh, right. Has any of the Jewish guilt yet run, rubbed off on you? No. <laughs> we'll talk about that another time. Okay. Uh, uh, Catherine, like. I'm Catherine. This is my partner, Misha. So you said Detroit, Michigan. I was like, woo woo, because I'm not from Detroit, but I'm from Michigan. So I was like, okay. Where in uh, Michigan? I'm from Bloom. Well, okay. I'm originally from Farmington Hills, which well, is right that's, that's Detroit area. You know, that's like yeah, greater yeah, Toronto. Yeah. And you probably know West Bloomfield very well. I didn't live in West Bloomfield. I lived in, uh, where did I live? That's what they call it. I'm <laughs> running a blank on it right now. Just outside of uh, 12, 12 Mile Road. Uh, oh, okay. Well, that was either Southfield. Southfield, or Southfield. There we go. Uh, Southfield is old. huge. <laughs> um, yeah. So I am doing this. Actually, it's funny because my first experience with religion was Judaism. I actually grew up and went to the JCC for preschool. And my parents actually are Christians. We're non-denominational. So I, it's kind of was a weird thing because I grew up like experiencing both religions at the same time. And I'm, I feel like it's kind of going full circle for me now. So I, I'm kind of getting back to that. <laughs> oh, it's a little bit more mature than it was when you were in the school with JCC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> okay, okay, Karina. Hey, my name is Karina and this is my fiance, Matthew. Um, we're both doing this course well, I'm doing this course, but um, he's doing it too. You buy yeah, the right everybody, everybody gets to take the test. All partners <laughs> get to take the test, and then we see whether or not we move your Judaism from you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're hoping at the end of this we can both be Jewish. So better, better he better do well on these exams. Um, but yeah, I guess I grew mm. up. Uh, <laughs> Christian Orthodox. My family wasn't super religious, so I didn't have a religious upbringing at all. Um, but I moved to Canada when I was about 12, and I lived in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. So as a result, the majority of my friends are Jewish, and I'm looking forward to officially joining the tribe. So very excited. Okay. All right, going down my list, Renee is next. Uh, hello, my name is Renee. I usually go by Ren, though, so. Ren, I'm going to mark it down. I don't promise I'll remember, but I'm marking it down, Ren. Thanks. Um, I am going into my second year of nursing school this September. Oh, yeah. um, I was, my family is kind of not practicing Christian. Like, some of my grandparents are very Catholic. Catholic, but my family isn't, but I was always kind of, I felt that 
that something was missing in my life growing up and I was always searching for a kind of like spiritual home sort of thing I guess and I I try didn't fit right for a number of reasons and just for a long time in my life I've been very interested in Judaism um, a lot of time in and out of the hospital when I was young and I had a friend there who was Orthodox Jewish so I got to learn a lot about her and and just the beliefs in general and um, now that I'm actually an adult and more independent and stuff I can take um, the initiative to to learn more myself and and, and I, I feel that Judaism might be what I've been looking for in my life. Nikki? Hi, so my reasoning is probably pretty similar to Ren's, um, not the hospital part, but the everything else. Um, it's just, I felt like something was missing. I grew up around a lot of Jewish people, like very close family friends who were mm -hmm. second family. Um, so I just always learned a lot about it and just want to see if it's the right thing for me. Okay. All right. Teresa? Holbrook? There you are. Okay. Hello. My name is Teresa. This is my partner, Adam. Um, he's already Jewish, so, you know, <laughs> I'm taking this course mostly because I feel like religion is missing in my life. Um, I grew up non-religious. I don't really know anyone in my family who is religious. And, you know, I feel like there's kind of a missing piece in that puzzle. Uh, Judaism really speaks to me. I agree with, I mean, a lot of it. Um, I, I love learning about it. I enjoy it, so I'm hoping that this is what I'm looking for. And yeah. Okay. Alina? Hi, everyone. I'm Alina. Uh, this is my fiance, Dekel. We're taking the course um, because I'm really interested in getting a deeper understanding in the religion. I feel really connected to it, and I've been fortunate enough to be really close with his family over the last four years that we've been together. Uh, so yeah, just hoping to learn more and hopefully at the end of this, uh, I think conversion is one of our end goals. Okay, Corey. You're, you're, oh, there you are. Hi, yeah, I just set the unmute. <laughs> yeah. um, hi, so yeah, I'm Corey. Um, I, uh, I think a lot of us, I guess, have a lot of similar uh, reasons, but I, I, uh, I'm from the Bahamas originally. Um, which is an extremely, extremely religious, like Christian religious place. Um, and so pretty much all of my family is extremely religious, but I just, you know, uh, I went from born Anglican, rebaptized Catholic when I was a kid, when my mom remarried, um, you know, uh, went to Catholic high school and, and just, I've always been really, really curious and always questioning and never really quite um, satisfied with some of the answers I got with the Christianity. And then I had a really amazing grade 11 teacher um, who taught philosophy and made us learn Greek to learn philosophy for whatever reason. He made us learn how to read and write Greek in grade 11. Um, and then uh, international religion teacher in grade 12. And it kind of just kept on going from there. And I've always been sort of studying something mostly within the Abrahamic faiths. And I think I've always just been drawn to Judaism, uh, both uh, just from the happenstance that so many of my closest friends just happened to be Jewish, whether they were secular or, or practicing. And uh, it's, so it's just kind of one of, been one of those things that continually comes up into my, in my life. And I guess the thing that really brought me here is that, you know, I've also felt that religion is missing. I worked in the nonprofit sector for several years um, and, you know, traveled and, you know, I've found myself moving towards that agnostic range and always feeling a little bit lost in that world. And, and, and I feel like right now is just the time for me to come back and kind of discover where I'm at. And one of the things I've always loved about Judaism is just the constant struggle and questioning and learning and arguing about God and religion and, and that being sort of really, really accepted and more or less encouraged. Um, and so I, um, 
uh, I'm excited to continue learning and, and sort of figure, where, fit, fit, figure out where I fit in the, in the tribe and hopefully, again, also convert and join. Okay. All right, uh, Joyce. Okay, I am, um, I was, I'm Joyce. I was, a, I was born and raised in Vancouver. And um, I was brought up in a very religious home. And I became, um, I started questioning a lot of things that I was born and raised with. And I started going to the um, JCC that I took two years of Hebrew there. And I became involved with the things going on there. And my interest in Judaism has just grown from there. Uh, Kaylee? Kaylee Mulder. Hi, so uh, my name is Kaylee and this is my partner, Matt. Um, we've been together for three years now. And I think this course is a way for me to um, like fully immerse myself in Judaism. I think I've had a decent amount of exposure with his family over the last three years, like learning uh, culture and traditions. So I think it'll be really nice to sort of add some history and real learning um, to sort of the exposure that I've already got. And yeah, I'm excited to take this course with everyone. Uh, Tiziana. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tiziana. I'm joining this course so that I can raise my son with the Jewish faith and also for myself. So hopefully at the end of the course, I can uh, do and finish my conversion. And Lindsay. Hi, everybody. I'm Lindsay. This is my boyfriend, Drawer. Um, we've been dating for just celebrated our second anniversary. And um, I'm really excited to take this course just to get a better understanding of Judaism. And um, you know, we've been able to celebrate a lot of the the um, the holidays and just the culture and immersing myself in the, over the last couple of years. Um, I actually grew up in a Protestant household. Um, we I went to church probably until the age of twelve, and then at that point, my parents made the decision to let us decide what we wanted to do uh, as far as our religion and our faith was concerned. And it was something that I didn't pursue after that. Um, and when Jor and I met his um, his family and, and himself, they're very much uh, involved in the religion, and I think that's just so special. And being able to carry on those traditions and that faith with our hopefully future family is something that we're uh, we're looking forward to. All right, I know Kyle's not here tonight. Uh, Elaken. You, you, I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yeah, but you have to be louder. You got to turn up your volume. All right. Can you hear me okay now? Kacha, kacha, as they say in Hebrew, sort of. <laughs> um, my name is Blake and this is my partner, John. Um, that's my fiance, I guess. Um, we've been together for six years now. Um, and uh, I interested in Judaism because John's family is Jewish um, and they were always very welcoming with me um, and shared a lot of the, their traditions and holidays um, with me and uh, so we wanted to take this course together to learn more um, and uh, hopefully at the end uh, we'll, uh, we'll end in conversion. I, I turned up my volume a little bit, so I helped on my side as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Miriam. Hi, I'm Miriam, um, and this is my husband, Michael. Um, I am taking this course. Um, I've been participating in a Jewish life for a little over six years. And now that we are expecting, I am taking the course so that we can raise um, our kids in the religion. Okay. Uh, okay. 
now, Amber. Now we got you in the right spot in the uh, alphabet here. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Amber. This is my fiance, David, and I'm taking the course to learn more about Judaism. Um, my first exposure was um, before David and I met. We had some phone conversations about his uh, desire to raise um, his children in a Jewish family um, and home. And so my first exposure was uh, Passover Seder in 2020, uh, which was virtual. Um, and we had family members from all over the world, from California to Israel. Um, and ever since then, we've been um, doing our best to, to keep a Jewish home. And um, starting this process, uh, we're getting married next year. And uh, like most of you, hoping to end in conversion um, and go from there. Uh, I apologize. Is it, is it your first name Cisneros or last name Cisneros? My last name is Cisneros. Oh, okay. Put it down wrong on my thing. All right. So, Giomara? Giomara? Giomara, yes. Giomara. Oh. Uh, hi, everyone. This is my boyfriend, Pedro. And we have been dating for two years. And like many of you here, I'm taking the courses to learn more about Judaism because I know it's very important for him. So, once we get married and we do decide to raise our kids under the Jewish faith and hopefully convert at the end as well. Heather? Hi, I'm Heather. Um, so I'm patrilineal Jewish also. This is my partner, Garrett. We're engaged um, and we've been together for two years. Um, I'm patrilineally Jewish. Um, my I'll dad- talk about that later. And tonight, I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, did you grow up in a synagogue of some kind? Um, I went to a reform synagogue sometimes when I was younger, um, but I never really vibed well with reform Judaism for whatever reason. It just wasn't for me. So I decided to, try, I'm beginning the conversion process into conservative Judaism. I feel like it's just a better fit for me. Um, and yeah, that's why I'm here. Um, and for for me, I, I grew up uh, out in uh, uh, northeastern Ontario in a very culturally Catholic uh, household. My my dad's side's Irish Catholic. My mom's side's Ukrainian Catholic. Um, and I, as I got older, I got more interested in religion and philosophy. And the more I started reading about religion and philosophy, the further away I felt. Uh, from Catholicism and uh, once I ended up moving to Toronto and meeting her and we live in a very Jewish community I really found that I felt the most comfortable in Jewish circles and uh, uh, I felt a real pull to Judaism so that's why uh, we're both here because we're engaged now and hoping to uh, convert before we get married and raise our kids in the faith and yeah. Okay. So I guess it's like you're both students, and I guess I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and is Tanya here? Tanya? Tanya? No? Okay. I think they weren't going to be here. Uh, a couple of people that I knew in advance weren't going to be here, but it did get marked down there. Okay. So now everybody. Rabbi. Yes. Robert, we're sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. We were a really late addition. Um, my oh. name's Jordan, and this is my fiance, Jill. And we just uh, got invited through our sponsoring Rabbi, Rabbi Grover. Um, okay. So I just wanted to quickly uh, just introduce ourselves and, uh, and let Jill uh, introduce herself as well. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Jill. And similar to a lot of you, um, my fiance, Jordan's Jewish, and I'm looking to learn more about the Jewish religion and hopefully raise our kids Jewish as well and yeah we've been together for seven years going on eight and we're getting married next year so just excited to learn more okay I saw you I didn't you know didn't put it together all right so please get your uh, information to me so I can yeah. call on you properly when we come to it all right okay sorry Rabbi we're in the same bucket as uh Jordan and Jill yeah uh, so we weren't on your list but we're here and we'll We'll make sure to be on the list for next time. Well, okay. Did we get our introduction properly? Sure. Uh, this is my fiance, Josie, and I'll let her uh, take it from here. Uh, hi. So I'm Josie, and this is Richard. Um, we're engaged, and 
uh, the more I spend time with his family, the more I get interested in the faith and um, I'm hoping to learn more and hopefully by the end of it, convert. So that's where we are. I miss anybody else? All right, so if you, if you haven't gotten information from me or you haven't sent your information to me, please do, please do so. Uh, and if you don't have the outline or any, if you're missing anything, the, the outline or the application forms, you drop me a line, uh, ravmjberman at gmail.com and uh, we'll move on from there, okay? All right. Now, I also want to add one thing, as you know, looking on the screen here, uh, you will see people who have all kinds of different looks to them. And a matter of fact, even though, as I'm going to say in a minute, Judaism is in one way an ethnic identity, it has an ethnic identity that includes people of all kinds of colors, shapes, forms, uh, attributes uh, in the world. If, especially, you know, here in Toronto, you may not know, but if you are walking down the street in, in, in Israel and uh, the likelihood of the person that's walking down the street is they're going to be Jewish. And it may be funny, they don't look Jewish, but then I don't know what Jewish looking is necessarily. Um, and, uh, and the fact of the matter is in, in recent history, many more people uh, in, in North America have converted to Judaism. So the, the complexion of the Jewish people in North America is, is wide as well, in getting wider perhaps. Um, now, I made a couple of things. Let's see here. I know. Whoops. If you have a question, always please, you know, just raise a hand or yell at something. Okay. I'm going to share. Let's see. Okay. I put some things together. I haven't done this before, and you may decide it's no good, but don't worry about that another time. Okay. So, what does it mean to be Jewish? What is Judaism? I can give you a, a, a circular description. Judaism is what Jews do, and Jews do Judaism. Judaism makes you a Jew, when what Jews do makes Judaism, so that's not a really very good definition. Um, and furthermore, there are really two ways of identifying somebody who's Jewish. All right. uh, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is belief. Some of you have had uh, religious traditions in your background, and certainly most uh, people see uh, religion as being a belief system. Right? Uh, in Christianity, uh, you're not simply you're not simply born a Christian. You have to be baptized. And you may be baptized for different uh, Christian groups, right? Uh, uh, who was it uh, that said they had started for Anglican and became Catholic, right? Uh, although they may be closely related to each other, they still demand certain things of you, right? So, but it's usually considered to be belief. Everybody see my screen that I got here? Is there a problem? All right, okay. So if you believe in Judaism, presumably you're a Jew. Well, it's a little more complicated than that, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. Secondly, there is a definition of Judaism as a person born, I, I put down here, which is the traditional understanding of a Jewish mother. If your mother was Jewish, by traditional Jewish teaching, you're Jewish. Okay. Uh, that's what we call uh, matrilineal descent. Uh, strangely enough, while Judaism traditionally is very patriarchal, I don't deny that, yet when it comes to identity of being a, an ethnic Jew, traditionally it was uh, determined uh, by uh, parentage and by your mother's parent, being from your mother was. If your mother was Jewish and your mother's mother was Jewish and your mother's mother was Jewish and the mother's mother, you know, and going back ad infinitum, 
Matthew are Jewish. Right. Uh, it's, you know, so it's sort of like a nationality and ethnic group. You can be Irish, you can be Italian, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what you believe or do, but that is who you are in terms of an ethnic identity. Um, now, according to number one, then, you would think <clears throat> since Judaism is a religious identity, by definition, one should be able to become a Jew, simply adopt the Jewish religion. If, and at the same time, one should be able then to abandon Judaism and no longer be a Jew. That would be the balance here, right? You adopt Judaism and whatever the requirements are in terms of converting to Judaism, that makes you a Jew. You decide you no longer want to be a Jew and you convert to another religion, you're no longer a Jew by that kind of definition. Now, the world doesn't necessarily work that way. As a matter of fact, there were Jews in the Holocaust who not only had converted to Catholicism, but there was a nun uh, who was uh, take, killed in the Holocaust in, in one of the concentration camps. As far as the Nazis were concerned, uh, it was an ethnic identity that could not be changed. And that is, you know, uh, uh, if number two, this ethnic identity is the, the criteria, then by definition, one cannot become a Jew. You have to be born a Jew, right? Uh, I can't be Italian. Uh, maybe I can throw an accent in there or something like that, but I'm not Italian. I can't become Italian. I can't become Chinese. I cannot become uh, uh, Mexican. Uh, you know, I, I'm not of that ethnic identity. Furthermore, then you can never cease being a Jew. If it's an ethnic identity, you can never abandon being Jewish because first of all, we won't let you, you can't go from being who you are. And the world won't. Uh, allow it either. And so actually both concepts are true. Judaism cannot be defined simply as a religious belief, nor simply as an ethnic identity. It's a combination of these two ideals. Uh, through the act of conversion, one becomes a Jew. Uh, and uh, one can be born a Jew, but being born a Jew is not dependent upon following Jewish law. But becoming a Jew is, depending upon the, the various approaches that we have in Judaism to how that takes place. Furthermore, once a Jew, according, again, this is tradition, the traditional interpretation, once a person converts to Judaism, they are ethnically Jewish their genes automatically become Jewish genes. That's why they're Levi's. Uh, all right. Uh, but the, I know it took, some people took a while to get the joke. Um, but the, the strange part of it is, by once a person converts to Judaism, if uh, traditionally, if it's the female, her future children are Jewish no matter what, even should they decide no longer to practice Judaism, she is Jewish. Now, as was noted before that in the Jewish world today, there are some who uh, have rejected the idea of, of matrilineality as being the sole definition of who is a Jew. And in the reform and the reconstructionists, they accept the idea if either parent is Jewish and the person growing up identifies the uh, Judaism and is somehow raised as being Jewish, then they will recognize that individual as being a Jew. Uh, but uh, in the conservative movement and in the Orthodox world, that is not the accepted uh, definition of, of, of uh, inherited ethnic Judaism. Okay. But so remember, it is both a religious identity and it is a um, 
ethnic identity. They, they come together, they create this bond that's inseparable. And, and that's why I say, you know, once you're, once you're Jewish, if you accept upon yourself the yoke of the commandments, in a moment we'll talk about that, then for Jewish tradition, everything you do from then on is judged on the scale of Judaism. Uh, now, furthermore, oh, by the way, uh, most of you are muted. If you have a question, unmute yourself and yell because I can only see a few of you when I've got this up on the screen. Okay. Now, conversion, because we're not talking right now about ethnic identity. Anybody who's identified here ethnically as a Jew, you're, you're a Jew. The rest of you who are taking the class are talking about the act of conversion. Um, and conversion, first of all, in the modern world begins with study. To be a Jew requires knowledge. Now, we don't expect you to have the same knowledge of the rabbis. We don't expect you to know the entire Torah, all of the Talmud, uh, all of the Midrashim. I don't know all of that either. But we do have a certain level of understanding that we think is important for you to develop and understand. Okay? So, so we, that's what this course is about. This course is about giving you the background information, the knowledge necessary, uh, hopefully to help you on that path to your Jewish life, or to help you deal with Jewish children or deal with Jewish members of your extended family, whatever the case may be. So we begin with study. Then, according to tradition, one must accept the mitzvot, the commandments. In Hebrew, we say, O machut shemayim, the yoke of, of, of divine uh, kingship, kingship of heaven. Those are the mitzvot. We talk, we'll talk in depth about some of the mitzvot during the course of the year. Traditionally, we say the Torah, the five books of Moses, contain 613 commandments, 613 mitzvot most of which really don't apply today. A lot of them had to do with the temple and sacrifice, et cetera. But uh, according to the, the traditional understanding of conversion, one must accept the entirety of Torah. One cannot say, I, I will convert to being Jewish, except I will not observe the Sabbath. Or I convert to Judaism, but I will not refrain from eating shellfish. And that's the traditional understanding of it. So one of the things that the sponsoring rabbi will go over with you, and one of the things that the Beit Din, the rabbinic court that supervises the conversion will go over with you, is whether or not you accept upon yourself the mitzvot. You may not be able to do all of them right now. You may have some uh, learning to do in order to get there but you cannot have rejected the Torah. You cannot have rejected the mitzvot, any of the mitzvot. If you reject them, you're rejecting the authority of Torah. And so traditionally that would invalidate any kind of conversion that would take place. You know, and if you got some questions, issues, this is where you're supposed to talk to your, your uh, sponsoring rabbi to help you uh, on that particular matter. Men, males must be circumcised. Uh, you'll you'll hear people saying you're going to a bris or a brit milah. The word brit actually means covenant. Milah is the word for circumcision. So the covenant of circumcision is the symbol of the Jewish male on the, uh, uh, that they have accepted the yoke of heaven. And uh, if you are already circumcised, then what happens is uh, a drop of blood is drawn from the side where the circumcision normally takes place. It's a very minor kind of procedure. If you're not circumcised and talk to your sponsoring rabbi about what's going to take place in terms of Brit Mila for you. Okay. As for men, obviously for women, there is no such uh, uh, act. Finally, both men and women have to immerse in the mikvah. 
at the end, towards the end of the, the, the course, we'll go into detail about the mikvah. Essentially, it's a body of water, a very small swimming pool, if you would, but it has special rules and regulations on what, what constitutes a kosher mikvah for a person to uh, enter into in order to become Jewish. One immerses themselves three times. Uh, after the first immersion, one says a blessing. Uh, sometimes they say a second blessing as well. And then uh, immerse themselves two more times and come out of the water as a Jew, a rebirth, a new birth. Um, and it is, the rabbis took this very seriously. They saw the act of conversion as truly being reborn. Before the modern concept of rebo being reborn was this Jewish ideal. It was to such an extent, but no, you know, I'm gonna tell you, I'm warning you in advance, don't, don't jump out of the window right now. It was such an extent that in theory, if a brother and sister converted, they are no longer related to each other. And in theory, they could get they could get married. But of course, the rabbis forbade such a thing from taking place because obviously it's not uh, appropriate. But that's the, the way it took place. When you come out of the mikvah as a Jew, you come out as a newborn person, uh, completely uh, free from any relations in the world. Although obviously you have family relations, you have your, your extended families or whatever the case may be. And we're not telling anybody to abandon any of that, God forbid. Uh, but it is to be taken seriously. And you think about it, if when you immerse in the mikvah, the best way to do it is kind of crouch down. You lift your feet off the bottom of the mikvah pool and you're almost in a fetal position. And you come up from the fetal position like a newborn child. So very symbolically, it works that way. It's always done under the supervision of rabbinic court. Traditionally, uh, it was male. Uh, there are uh, also today some Bate Din that have female rabbis who are on the Beit Din. If the Beit Din has got male rabbis on it, we are not in the room when a woman is immersing. Instead, we'd be next door, be able to hear and uh, be able to supervise uh, uh, that way. Uh, obviously, if a female is uh, a, a female rabbi is involved with it, then she would be in the mikvah room with uh, a female. And if it's a male, the, the reverse would take place. Okay? But it has to take place under the supervision of a bait din, a, a recognized rabbinic court. Okay. Now, uh, I was reminded recently of something that, that one of my uh, fellow rabbis does, and I wanted to uh, bring it to your attention because I think it is a very important idea uh that is being expressed in this uh whoops okay there was a german jewish philosopher a theologian by the name of franz rosenzweig uh, and we'll talk a little bit about him later on it's, it's it's not i'm not worried about you remembering it's franz rosenzweig right now but he talked about building on very strong jewish ideas that uh in, in, which form what he called the star in his book called the star of redemption. Uh, namely, we have two, three, two different sets of relationships. We have one, the very traditional idea that is expressed in the, in the, in the Talmud, expressed in mystical works of God, Torah, and Israel. God is the one who reveals the Torah. The Torah is the law for Israel. And Israel accepts God by accepting his Torah. And so there's this relationship, these two ends of the tri the three ends of the triangle of God, Torah, and Israel. So you have a theological construct, you have a, a an action construct, a behavior construct, and you have an ethnic identity construct. Rosenzweig also speaks about how God 
is active in the world through three points of the, of the second uh, triangle. Creation, God is the creator of the universe, the creator of life. God reveals to, through the prophets, ideas and laws and concepts, which is revelation. And then finally, there's the hope for ultimate redemption of the world that uh, we usually today often talk about the messianic era of a better world sometime in the future. So we can begin with this kind of an understanding uh, to help us through the course of the year, how everything is going to fit in. We will talk about the Torah and the rest of the Bible. We will talk about understandings of revelation, different approaches to revelation. We will talk about the diff issues of science and creationism and creation. And we'll talk about Israel, both as Israel, the people, and Israel as the state, the Zionist dream, and hope for that we look for the ultimate redemption. Okay. Now, uh, are there any questions so far on anything that I've, I've dealt with this evening? No. So I check the note here. All right. All right. Now, normally, what we're going to do is we have approximately two hours uh, stretch. Uh, historically, when we met in person, I usually gave the class an option. Did you want to just go all the way through? And if somebody had to step out for a few minutes during the course of the time, they step out. And we would be finished by, uh, instead of 9.30, about 9.15 or so. Uh, so far on Zoom, we've been just going straight through uh, without making any breaks. If you have to take a break, you can do so, obviously. Um, and so that's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, and also because of the, the uh, when the holidays are coming up, I wanted to start this evening also talking about the Jewish calendar. All right. And so let me get rid of this one. Let's see with that other. Okay. All right. So I've not, have I lost anybody yet? Everybody's still here. Stay with me. All right. Uh, by the way, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we will have tests at the end of each semester. Uh, and uh, I will give you a practice test uh, at, at some point. Uh, later on, just to give you an idea of what kind of things I'm going to expect you to remember. I don't expect you to remember everything. Uh, Most what I'm looking for is the major details. Okay? Uh, and uh, you'll see that uh, as we go along. Uh, Lindsay, the dog does not have to take the test, by the way. What is that? Sheep dog? It's a it's cute. small Australian shepherd. Okay, I was close. There's a, there's a regular Australian show. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah, she's, uh -huh. she's the one that wants the attention. Aha. Uh -huh. well, we, we've got a Boston and a uh, uh, Havanese, which is kind of like a, a little white uh, sissy dog. Okay. All right. So we're going to go into more detail on some of these things with theology as, as, as we go along. Uh, but uh, just to, right now, I just wanted to let you have that opening idea. Now, some of you may wonder, how is it that Rosh Hashanah is so early this year? Anybody know when Rosh Hashanah is? It starts the night after Labor Day. Sunday <laughs> night. Yeah, 99 Labor Day. Oh, you think? It's around the corner. We're almost there. Um, last year, anybody remember when Rosh Hashanah was? Well, Rosh Hashanah was a week and a half uh, later, about 11 days later. Okay. 
Uh, and so in order to understand all of this, we have to understand something about the calendar. All right. I even decided this year to give you some help on that with the pictures. All right. When we think of the calendar, there are really two calendars that operate in the world. There is the solar calendar, the so-called uh, Gregorian calendar, that, which this is the year uh, 2021. I think that's still correct. Uh, but on the other hand, there is also a lunar calendar. Now, the easiest calendar to, to have is the lunar calendar, because basically every month, you have a sign of a change in time. You know, approximately 30 days, uh, the moon goes through its cycles and returns back to the beginning. But actually the, the cycle of the moon is 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes and three seconds. At least that's what I found on Wikipedia. And Wikipedia is always right. right? Um, so it's problematic, which we will talk about in a, in a moment, uh, about when you start a month. After all, if it's 29 days, 12 hours, and 44 minutes, three seconds, does that mean we start a new month in the middle of the afternoon, middle of the night? Uh, it's, a, it's a question. Okay, so we'll come back to that picture in a moment. On the other hand, there is the solar year. Had to make it for okay. The sun, which does not circle the earth, contrary to ancient beliefs, but the earth circles the sun. And it takes 365 days, five hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds. Again, thanks to Wikipedia, uh, for the earth to circle the sun. Now, a solar year unless you really know what you're doing, is a little more difficult to really keep count of. You have to know when to start the year's counting. Um, and different societies who have used a solar calendar have had different days that they consider to be the beginning of the new year. But uh, regardless of that, the, the 365 days was pretty much the accept, and a, a quarter was the accepted time that either the sun circles the earth, or as we know, the earth circles the sun. Now, the problem is when you, don't, when you have a calendar that shortens it from 365 days, five hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds to 365 days and a quarter, so that every four years you have a leap year, the actual relationship between the Earth and its orbit around the sun is going to drift. Because you don't come back to the same spot exactly in the orbit. Uh, and so uh, while for many years, uh, the world counted the solar calendar by 365 and a quarter days, just alternating, right? Uh, every fourth year being a leap year. By the Middle Ages, that began to be a problem. And so uh, the, what we call the Gregorian calendar was established in 1582 by Pope Gregory the 13th. And uh, it moved the year from being 365.25 days to 365.2425 days. And so without going into any great depth there, uh, it, every, every year that is divisible by four is a leap year, except for years that are divisible by 100. But if those 100 years, central years are leap years, if they are exactly divisible by 400. I have a question. You don't have to remember any of this part. Just give me a background. Yes, what was the question? Okay, so why did it become an issue? I know that like we're going to be a little bit further ahead, but it doesn't seem okay. like 
Yeah. Um, it would have create that much of difference because not we're not talking like millions and millions of years. Well, I'll tell you now for the church, which is why Pope Gregory did this, which really is the Jewish issue as well. But there was it was it was a slightly different variant of the same issue. When is Easter fall? It's in spring and like, yeah, April. Okay. okay. Yeah, usually around April. Well, the actual definition is the first Friday after the first Sunday after the uh, first full moon of the autumnal equinox or something like that. In other words, you have to have a full moon and you have to have, I think, a Friday before it can be Easter. Follow? And really, the problem was this. The Torah, we'll leave Pope Gregory by the side. The Torah says that the holiday of Passover must be in the springtime. All right, Mechodesh Aviv is the biblical account. And the major holidays, Passover, Sukkot, Shavuot, and Sukkot, those three, what we call pilgrimage festivals, are all also agricultural festivals. They mark uh, the harvest times for different crops. Now, if uh, I'm going now back to the lunar calendar, okay? So let's go back to the lunar calendar. It was still a problem for the uh, solar calendar, but we'll go back to the lunar calendar and see where the real issue came for Judaism uh, as well. Okay, so Judaism essentially is based on a lunar calendar, 12 months of the year. 12 months times 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three seconds does not come out to 365. Comes out to 355, 54, depending. So let us say, for argument's sake, this year Passover fell on the 15th of April. 15th of April is after the, autumnal, uh, uh, the spring equinox. I I said autumnal, it's spring equinox, right? Uh, which is around March 20th. So let us say we didn't do anything to the Jewish calendar. You just follow like the Muslims do. The Muslims don't adjust their calendar. Next year, when would Passover fall in the uh, civil calendar, solar calendar? Subtract 11 from 15. Now you have it on April 4th. Okay, no big deal. Next year, it's now March 24, 24, 34, March 23rd. You still do it. Passover still falls in the springtime. But the next year, it's going to fall in, in the end of winter. And before you know it, it's in the middle of the winter. All right. So in order to make sure that Passover falls in the proper season, the Jewish calendar has a leap year system, which means Three times in 19, uh, no, seven times in 19 years, we add a month to the calendar. By doing that, it makes it balance, more or less. Okay? And the early church actually, the early church uh, determined when Easter was by finding out from the Jews when Passover was. But eventually that was considered to be inconvenient and not appropriate, et cetera. And that's why the church came up with its own calculations. But now they're dealing with a solar year. And that same drift, maybe not as bad, but that same drift begins to come into the calendar. Oh, it's, it's one day or every so century, I think it was, that it was off. It affects us in the Jewish calendar to a lesser extent. Uh, in an area that you're really not going to be worried about. But um, it is a, an error that is still part of the Jewish calendar. The solar, we have what I call a solar lunar calendar or a lunar solar calendar. In other words, 
the basic calendar is lunar, but we adjust the lunar calendar so that it stays put more or less with the solar calendar. So the Passover always falls in the spring. Okay, so it's not merely a lunar calendar. It's really a solar lunar calendar. And it's important to remember. That's uh, number one, okay? So when there's not a leap year, the holidays tend to come 10, 11 days earlier in the civil calendar than they did the previous year except when it's a leap year, in which case it's going to be moved up by about 21, 22 days. There are other rules that we'll talk about in a little bit too, but that's important to know that there's a leap year. And in the Jewish calendar, the leap year is an entire month, 30 days. Okay. Now we know the, the lunar calendar was easy to deal with because all you had to do was know how to look at the moon. And so I, I, I brought this chart for you, this here, okay? So the, you know, when, is, uh, when do we no start the month? We start the month when there's a new moon. And then as the month goes on, more and more of the moon becomes a, uh, discernible until at the middle of the month, the 15th of the month, we have a full moon. And then it starts to wane and wane and wane and wane until we have no moon and then we start all over again. For those of you who remember your astronomy, what's going on is the full moon appears when the sun is in this part of the sky. The full moon is almost always at sunset. Because the only way you can have a full moon is for the sun to be on one side of the earth, not a direct angle, because then you have an eclipse, and the moon to be at the other side, because the moon just reflects the light. So as, the, as it goes around the earth and it turns, I mean, it doesn't, you know, the, the moon actually doesn't turn, it always faces the same way, but it looks to us as if parts of it are di differently lit up, right? That's number one. So we have to understand that the moon, which is dependent upon the sun for its light, it starts off being not seeable around sunset time, sunrise time, sunset. It's right, in other words, the moon is right near the sun when it's least visible. By near, I mean, if you look in the sky uh, to see where the sun is. And originally, what happened was that um, there would be people who would go to look to see if they could see the new moon. They would look in the sky, obviously before telescopes existed, and see if they can see this very little crescent of the moon. If they could see that little bit of crescent of the new moon, According to the Mishnah, which is a compilation of, of traditional Jewish oral law, which is compiled around the year 200, we'll talk about it much later on, 200 CE, they would go out, and if they saw the new moon, they would then go to the Beit Din, the court, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin, the rabbis on that court would ask them questions to make sure they did indeed see the new moon, what part of the sky was it in, what time of day was it, et cetera, et cetera. If the court accepted their testimony that they saw the new moon, then they would say today is Rosh Chodesh. The day is the first day of the month. Right now we're in the month of Elul, so let us say they saw the new moon. Now we count 29 days. Is the month going to be 30 days long or 29 days long? Because it's really, right? We had, we said it was 29 de, uh, uh, days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three seconds. 
So simply put, you're going to alternate a month of 30 days with a month of 29 days. Because between the two of them, you get more or less 60 days, right? 12 hours being half a day. It's off a little bit and that, that is accounted for uh, elsewhere. Okay. But now remember, we're talking about over 2000 years ago, the internet was in its early gestation period, pre-gestation, there was no internet, no telephones. I, uh, if I lived in Upper Galilee, and the court is in Jerusalem, how do I know if today is the 30th day of the month of Elul, or the first day of the month of Tishrei? Follow? We don't know. A month has to be at least 30 days long. It, can't be, it won't be longer, but it'll be 30 days long. It could be 29 days long. So if witnesses saw the new moon, went to the court, the court accepted their testimony because they knew the, the mathematics and everything of the astronomy of it, they would declare today to be the first day of the next month. If they did not see the new moon or the court had a reason for rejecting their testimony, that day becomes the 30th day of the month. You know, if you had to write a contract, you're in real trouble. You know, you know what day do you put on your contract for that day? You know, is it today, is night, today the 29th of the month or is today the first of the next month? All right, that's a problem. So in the Jewish calendar that we use today, we mostly alternate between 29 and 38 months. There's a, some exceptions to that. But we celebrate the beginning of a month. Right? There's a, we call it Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the month, the new moon, the head of the month. And we have a celebration, certain things that take place in the synagogue life uh, that recognize that this is the first day of the month. But also because of this possibility that the 29th, the 30th day is really the first of the next, you know, last of the previous month, have you, it, it, go, it works this way. If a month is 29 days long, next month has a Rosh Chodesh of one day. If the month is 30 days long, the last day of the month is called Rosh Chodesh. And the first day of the next month is called Rosh Chodesh. Uh, I have that. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, where did I put it? Calendar. Okay, let me bring that up now. Okay, just a second, guys. Rob, I have a question. Yeah. I'm just curious because I mean I'm 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 Israeli and I speak Hebrew, but will you be going over like the simple terminology like Rosh Chodesh and uh there will be vocabulary things that we will obviously have to deal with. Okay. Uh and also, we'll be, we'll be learning some Hebrew. Okay. All right. But Just because I'm, I'm kind of translating to Lindsay, because I, okay. I, I... If anybody, if I, if I ever say a word that somebody doesn't recognize, please, you know, raise, yell, that sort of thing. Uh, where is it? Why is it not there? Let me try again. Share screen. That's not that. I had this problem before. Oh, there it is. Okay. This is a calendar that I downloaded. Uh, by the way, you know, we, we tell people to bring a calendar the first, 
first class today, you just go online and you, you can download it, what have you. All right, this is uh, 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 the month of August of this year. You will see that Sunday, the 1st of August is called, is the 23rd day of the month of Av. Saturday, the 7th of August is the 29th day of Av. The next day, Sunday, is the 30th day of Av and is called Rosh Chodesh. Rosh means head, literally head. Chodesh is month or new moon. The next day, which is the first day of the month of Elul, is also called Rosh Chodesh. Okay. So that's all due to the fact that there is built in a certain degree of uncertainty back then. Today we have a calendar. And so uh, none of us go out looking for the new moon in order to declare the month beginning. But uh, in recognition of that reality, and then we're gonna come up with some more of that in a moment, uh, we indeed uh, have two days of Rosh Chodesh, two days of celebrating the new month, the 30th of the previous month and the first day of the next month, okay? By the way, I like, just like to tell people, by the time you're through with this course, you're gonna to have to know a little bit of Hebrew and understand some Hebrew. I probably throw in a little, and there's a little bit of Yiddish gets thrown in here. Uh, not much, I'm not a Yiddish speaker, but it gets thrown in here. And uh, who knows what else gets gets thrown into the mix, okay? That was, was Drawer was asking me about that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. That was yeah, well, I would hope with, well, you know, just because your parents named you Drawer doesn't mean you're a Hebrew speaker. And my son, Eitan, although he can speak Hebrew too, but that's neither here nor there. We had another couple of, of uh, nice Hebrew names here. Uh, Deco. He, yeah. yeah. He, he, he's waving his palm at us because Deco means a palm tree. Right? Yeah, good one. Uh, good. <laughs> All right. My Hebrew name is Menachem, which is comfort. I don't know why it was a comfort. I was born my parents' first wedding anniversary. I don't know if that's a comfort or not. But anyway, okay. At least I was, no, I was for sure I was legitimate. They'd been married for a whole year. Okay. Did I say that? I, I never say anything that's, un, you know, it's no more than PG-13. Okay. All right, so let's get to another issue. Uh, Jorah would be familiar with this if he remembers uh, life in Israel. How many days do we celebrate a holiday? Well, according to the Bible, we'll start, we'll talk about Passover. It's the easiest one to do it. Pesach, which is the Hebrew for Passover. I want everybody to learn how to say Pesach. Just be able to, you know, clear your throat. And you know, just don't spit too much on your screen. Okay. Pesach, we said, is seven days in the month of Nisan. And if you go to Israel, you will see that Israel, Israeli Jews celebrate Pesach, however they celebrate Passover, for seven days. Some are very strict, make sure they only have matzah during Pesach. I'm sure there's still some crazy left-wingers who make sure they have bread for Pesach, but neither case. Uh, Pesach is seven days biblically. Okay. Let's keep that a bit of information in our mind. Okay, now let's go back to our calendar issue. Let us say the month of Adar was 30 days long. Okay. So the next the first of a, of Nisan will follow after the 30th of Adar. Okay, let's say the 30th of Adar was 30th of April, just for argument's sake. Putting, now let's say March because we don't want uh, Pesach in, in May. So the 30th of March was the 30th of Adar. Or actually Adar Shane, but we'll go back. And so what would be the 31st of March becomes the first of Nisan. Count 15 days. It's the 15th of Nisan. You have your Passover Seder. 
you have your matzah, you have your Passover sacrifice, you do all the things that you do on Yom Tov, on a holiday. Next seven days, you don't eat chametz. If you are a, a, a religious Jew, you will not eat anything that has been leavened or had leavening in it, associated with it. And the eighth day, you go back to eating whatever you want. Your nice uh, rolls, whatever. Okay, Drink a nice beer. All right. But what if Adar was not 30 days long, but it was only 29 days long? So instead of March 31st being the first day of Nisan, March 30th was the first day of Nisan. All right, but you made the mistake of thinking it was 30 days long. You start Passover a day late. You're eating chametz. You're eating what you're not supposed to eat on Passover, which is a big no-no in the Bible. Conversely, if you thought it was 29 days long and it turns out to have been 30, you would be eating chametz on the last day of Passover. All right, so now let's go back to ancient Israel, Judea, pre and Roman times for sure. So now, witnesses come to the Beit Din. The witnesses tell them they saw the new moon. The court decides today is the new moon. How do we let everybody know in that era before electronic and before telephones and even before te uh, telegraph and all of that. How do we let everybody know when the month has begun? What well, says in the Mishnah that the night after, right, the morning after the 29th day, <laughs> all right, 29 days, that night people go up to look to see if they see the new moon. They see the new moon the next morning, they go to the Beit Din. Beit Din says, yeah, today's the new moon. Today's the beginning of the month. That night, signal fires are lit on all the mountaintops. And all the way from Jerusalem to, to all the way to Iraq and Baghdad and north to, Mes uh, to Asia Minor, overnight, the Jewish diaspora knows when Rosh Chodesh is. Everybody is okay. We know when Passover is now. But the Mishnah again says that it was a problem one year. The uh, Samaritans caused a problem in terms of being able to identify when Rosh Chodesh was. They lit their own fires or something. It's not clear what happened. That methodology, which was very quick to let the world know when Rosh Chodesh was, was no longer usable. So they had a Pony Express. Riders would go out from Jerusalem to inform everyone when Rosh Chodesh was, at least for Pesach and for some of the other holidays, so they would know when the beginning of the month is. But horseback riding is a lot slower than signal fires on the mountaintops. And so those communities that lived within a couple of weeks of, of the ridership, you know, get there before two weeks is up, they knew when Rosh Chodesh was. But if you lived further away, they didn't. So in order to play it safe, a, one day was added to the holidays. Outside of the land of Israel and its immediate environs, Passover became eight days. Shavuot, instead of one day, became two days. I'm skipping Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur for the moment. Sukkot, which is supposed to be seven days, followed by the eighth day of Shmini Atzeret, becomes a total of nine days. In Israel, it's still 
just the eight days. In Toronto, it's nine. Passover, seven days in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa, wherever. But in Toronto, it's eight days. Follow. Now, along comes Hillel II. And we're going to be finishing with this pretty soon. And he establishes the, the calendar that we use today. All of the calculations, all the things that are necessary to make sure that the calendar works when the leap years are, the seven times in the 19 year cycle. Some other things that are, are thrown in to make, uh, for example, we don't want Yom Kippur to fall on a Friday, Thursday night, Friday, or Saturday night, Sunday. Uh, or another holiday called Shoshana Rabbah, we don't want it to fall on Shabbat. So there's a little finagling in the calendar to make sure that doesn't happen. All of that is, is, is established. So if you know all of the calculations, you don't need anything else. So you know when Passover is. You know when Rosh Chodesh is. You have all this information. Why do we keep two days? The Talmud already asked that question. And there are two answers given in the Talmud. Uh, and there's a third answer I'm going to share with you as well. One answer given in the Talmud was perhaps when the Mashiach comes, we'll go back to that uh, methodology of letting people know because the Beit Din will meet and they'll send out messengers by lighting fires. But then along will come some authorities and say, you can't do it, you know, some anti Semite what's caused trouble for the Jews and they can no longer do that and they won't know for sure when Passover is and you'll be eating hummets on Passover. So therefore we keep the extra day. The second reason is the Talmud says Min once it becomes the established custom we maintain that custom. That's my wife going on the treadmill that you were hearing. Uh, you can't see her. Uh, no, you can't see her. She's way off back there. It's so on the other side of the room. The time. What? The time. Another time. She'll come and say hello another time. Okay. Where was I? Okay. So anyway, once you have an established custom, you stay with the custom. And that really traditional religious movements of any kind, I don't care what, what faith it is doesn't like change. Once things are established, once you begin to have something to be the customary practice, it's very hard to no longer follow that practice. And we'll find that in traditional Jewish uh, legal discussions, a constant theme, a, ver a big reluctance to ever change that which came before. And a part of the differences between the movements, between the very right-wing Orthodox on one side and the very liberal reform and reconstructionists on the other side is how you approach these kinds of questions. That's for another night. But that was the basic rule that it was established. Now, I said I skipped Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Problem with Rosh Hashanah is what day of the month does Rosh Hashanah fall in the Hebrew calendar? What day of the 30 days of the month? It's an easy answer. It's the first day of the month. Rosh Hashanah is the first of Tishrei. When is the new moon? The first of Tishrei. Who knows when the new moon is? How can they get people to know? And the whole issues about witnesses coming and everything. And to make a long story short, it became the standard practice, even in Israel, even in Jerusalem, to celebrate Rosh Hashanah for two days because of those issues. Now, what about Yom Kippur? Don't you have the same problem? Well, anybody want to fast for 48 hours? A show of hands. Anybody wants to fast for 48 hours for Yom Kippur? Anybody? No? You do? All right, all right. Crazy people. All right. There were some rabbis in the Talmud recorder who said they did they did fast for 24 hours, for 48 hours. But that's really asking too much of people. 
So the rabbis ruled that Yom Kippur would only be observed for one day throughout the, the Jewish world. And we'll see other things in which the rabbis are, are very important in deciding how things are to be done in the various practices that are, uh, occur. Okay. So let's understand. We have a calendar, which is a combination between a so lunar and a solar calendar. The lunar is set to adapt, to, uh, to, to be rectified so that the holidays do not uh, move too far from a certain point, right? Basically, so the Passover falls in the springtime. One of the ways the rabbis would determine whether or not it was going to be a leap year was they looked for signs of spring. They looked to see whether in Israel, the rains tend, uh, tend to be only in the winter months, very little rain after that. If the rains had stopped, if the roads are dried out, those are signs that it's okay uh, for Passover. If the sheep have had young, the goats have had young, it's a sign that it's okay to have Passover. But if the roads are still muddy and the sheep and goats have not yet had their young, that's a sign that it's not yet springtime, a sign that we need to make a leap year. So instead of uh, coming up with a whole new month altogether, they said when most years, Adar, which is a month just before Passover, before Nisan, normally it's 29 days. Okay. Actually, uh, normally it's 30 days. For, for Passover's sake, they would add a 30 day month. There would be a second Adar. First Adar will be 29 days long. Second Adar will be 30 days long. That way you don't have to remember too many names for months. We only have to have 12 names plus one, uh, two numbers. Uh, and uh, that would be a leap year. That now is built into the calendar. Every, approximately every three years, there's a famous mnemonic, Gavat Adzat, for those who want to remember it. The third, the sixth, I have to remember move from the Hebrew, the Gavat, the ninth, the 11th, the 17th, and the 19th year of the cycle are leap years, for those who really want to know that, okay? Uh, and the 14th, I skipped the 14th. Uh, but that's all built in. All you need to do is pick up a Jewish calendar and you will have that. Now, one other thing uh, that we will take up next week, because I don't like to go much later than night, a little after nine, is when does a day begin? When does a day end? And how are we supposed to know that? We have to begin with that next week. So we will continue a little bit more on the calendar then, and then I will send out another reminder about uh, what we're doing next week, okay? Any questions? Rabbi, will we get a copy of the slides? Uh, you, no, not real. I can, I can, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember to do that. Sure, why not? Uh, I say, well, I, I, uh, there's the thing you say, bleed nander. Without taking a, an oath to it, I will send out what I put on the screen. They're just reminder stuff, uh, but you can certainly have it. Thanks. I have my whole, all of my notes and everything. I got to keep something secret. Okay. So uh, we will meet again next week, 7.30 sharp, more or less. Please try to be here at 7.30-ish. Uh, and uh, then that's it. Good night, everybody. Have fun time was had by all. If you, uh, I will send you all also about how to get a copy or go on uh, YouTube if you want to review the class, okay?